Um, good morning. Um, just a little advert before I start. Um, uh, this morning, um, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, published uh, my short article on my blog, if you like, on soils in their website on, on Year of the Soils as an advert for this event. So um, if you want to pick up some of the heart of what I'm going to say, you'll find it there later on. Um, uh, this uh, talk is called The Answer Lies in the Soil. Um, in, in the 1960s, um, uh, when we had Sunday lunch afterwards, uh, because television was a sort of kind of new thing to us poor people in Britain, uh, we used to actually watch, listen to the radio a lot. And there were a lot of uh, very funny programs, The Goon Show, The Navy Lark, things like that. And um, this quote is actually from a guy called Kenneth Williams, no longer with us, but he used to play a character called Arthur Fallowfield. And Arthur Fallowfield was based on a real person who gave the first gardening talks on, on BBC Radio on the Home Service. And he's, whatever question he was asked, Arthur Fallowfield always started his answer with, uh, the answer lies in the soil. <laughs> and it does. Um, I believe absolutely passionately, and you've heard it said a number of times yesterday and today, that the most important thing that we have is soil. Um, the quote from Carol Chapek, I think, is particularly relevant. And I have to make an exception here, because as we've also heard this morning, we can't actually live without water and air either. Um, I should point out that all the photographs in this display, apart from Kenneth Williams, come from my garden. Um, so if you want to know what my garden looks like, you get a little introduction here. Um, the difference, of course, is that you know, we can't live without water and air now, today. But long term, we can't live without soil. Uh, and I just want to introduce you to a general concept and um, what that has done in our garden to demonstrate it, and our garden is an open demonstration for people to visit by arrangement. Um, and if you want to be on our mailing list, please do leave us your email address and we'll, we'll add you on. Um, this is a pond in our garden. There are two ponds in our garden. Um, and th there are some important things we need to understand about soil. And I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the converted when I run these by you. Firstly, soil has a mineral fraction and made up of three things, um, clay, sand, silt. Um, most of us, I'm sure, are familiar with this. There are also then living organisms in the soil and decaying organic matter from the life cycles of those living things having ended. Um, and it's these things together that create the substance of soil of course, soil doesn't really work very well unless it's got holes in it, pore space. Pore space is needed to accommodate air and water. But as I hope to, to show you today, and I'm sure my colleagues will do so following on me in a slightly more scientific way, the most important thing about soil is that it's alive. The key thing is life. We neglect soils at our peril. Um, this is a slightly misleading photograph. This is the Negev Desert, uh, which is a true desert, as opposed to one we created. But this is very interesting, because what's going on here is this is a field growing millet. Um, Berber tribes people come through here before the rains, and uh, with their slightly updated technology of Range Rover and plow, they plow up the wadis, uh, and they plant millet seed, and then they move on somewhere else. And then when the rains come, the millet is germinated, and they come back later in the year and harvest it. But this is a desert where the rainfall is about 10 millimeters a year. We're making deserts like this all every day uh, in, in this world. Um, uh, Iraq 
uh, was mentioned yesterday, the birthplace of agriculture, the Tigris-Euphrates Delta. Anybody who watched any of the Iraq wars on television will have noticed it's now a desert. Uh, Syria, a forest kingdom within historical memory. All these places were within historical memory, very great and productive soils, uh, and uh, produced huge amounts of produce and sustained large populations. Syria was a forest kingdom. There are still some forests left in Syria, but most of it's desert. Libya uh, and other parts of North Africa were the, the grain basket of the Roman Empire. Uh, where they grew wheat is now desert. So, we neglect soils at our peril. Um, I don't know if you know about Gertrude Jekyll, a famous landscape gardener. I quite like this because it's, it's very pertinent to our garden. Our garden is one-tenth of a hectare. Actually, it's 0.08 of a hectare, but in our research, we round up to one decimal place. So I call it 0.1. That is one-fifth of an acre for our American friends in particular, uh, who often don't think in metric, but it's not very big. Um, two years ago, this garden produced one metric tonne of food. That's 10 tonnes a hectare. Um, for 20 years, it took about two hours a week. Now it takes about two days a week because we do it slightly more intensively. We harvest our own rainwater, it produces all our firewood, and we produce 5,000 plants and 500 trees for sale in our nursery every year on 0.1 of a hectare. Um, this is an aerial photograph. Um, uh, Nancy, my wife and I, we live in the bungalow next to this uh, rather grand stable block with a four-story castellated tower. This photograph, it's the only aerial photograph I have. It was taken about 20 years ago. Um, the house is now twice the size because we've completely rebuilt it and made it very energy efficient. Uh, and the garden, you can't see anymore. You'll see why. That's 1990 when we started. So a blank canvas, just a flat field of weeds. This house was built in 1948 for a guy called the Gilly when he retired. Gilly is the Gallic word for a servant. It actually means the person who's the gamekeeper on the estate. So he would have been in charge of the fishing. And since the man who owned this estate only bought it for the fishing, when he retired, he was built this house and given it free for life. Uh, Mr. Taylor lived to be 96, by which time the new owners of the house were outside bursting brown, brown paper bags trying to get rid of him. But of course, at that age, he'd kind of given up gardening. At some time, they'd grown perhaps potatoes and runner beans. Um, he kept sheep dogs, which is a very typical thing for gillies to do. Um, but that was a blank canvas and not very fertile, surprisingly, because it had not been maintained as a walled garden, which it originally was for about 25 years. And so the fertility that had been there had largely gone. Uh, the photograph on the left was taken two years ago on an open day. That's uh, by the garden wall on the left-hand side. You'll see why I say you couldn't see the garden today because all of those trees are less than 25 years old. Uh, the picture on the right is a sign we just put out on open days to welcome people. We are a registered Scotland site, and in fact, there are still places, if anybody wants to come after the convergence on a Scotland tour, and we start in our garden and visit five other sites in Scotland. If anybody's interested, do ask afterwards. Um, it's my contention that anybody who grows anything is doing research, because if you don't learn from your mistakes, you'll carry on making the same mistakes. And one of the easiest ways to, 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 to learn how well you're doing is to measure what you do in some way. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is I actually worry about people, as, as Jeff was saying this morning, I really worry about people who don't make mistakes. Because if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying to do anything new. The important thing is not to keep making the same mistakes and preferably don't make any terminal mistakes, as I told my children many times. Um, I have a feeling myself that sometimes the lessons we have to learn in life take more than one mistake to learn because that's why we're on the planet to learn those things. However, 
we do research. Um, we were privileged um, last year to have a survey done by uh, uh, somebody who's actually at the conference here, who um, uh, was in his final year at uh, doing, doing a, a degree at um, Edinburgh University in plant sciences. And um, he measured eight sites in Scotland which are, are noted for organic production. Um, the results came back for seven. There was some reason why the eighth didn't appear, uh, which doesn't particularly matter. Um, and this, there are two graphs here. This, this bar chart shows you the levels of um, five particular nutrients in the soil. Uh, soluble nitrogen, insoluble nitrogen, um, potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Notice that Garden Cottage is top. And then the same kind of uh, figures for calcium. The reason calcium's on a separate chart is um, because it's much more prevalent and therefore in a bar chart it doesn't work to put them all together. Um, our, our garden came out top of these seven gardens in, in, in five of the categories and second in two of them. So one of the things you can see from the research is our garden produces plenty of nutrient in the soil. And mostly um, this comes from within the garden itself. So the garden is largely self-fertile. There are some minor exceptions to that, uh, which I won't go into just now. But what we're doing is we're creating a system which is uh, a complete cycle, a complete loop. We make about 15 cubic meters of compost a year. We have all kind of matter we return to the garden, and as you'll see. Um, I'm actually immensely grateful to this chap, uh, Justus von Liebig. Um, you could take Liebig as a pun. Um, <laughs> was this the big lie? But actually, if we go back in history, he was doing humanity a great service. In 1854, he, he worked out that the major nutrients in soil in chemical terms, were nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. The reason I say this might be a big lie is because what we now know is that many of the minor nutrients are as important as these. So, for example, if you want to grow sweet corn and you don't have manganese, you won't get any sweet corn setting. Yeah? So, the life chemically active, efficient soils are about a lot more than this. What's really important is what makes all these things work. Living processes, again. And just a throwaway thought for you. Who likes Marmite? Who hates Marmite? Yeah, Justus von Liebig also invented Marmite um, because he got into the idea that you could ferment um, the remains of brewing processes as a, as a healthy product. Um, there'll be a Marmite party afterwards. So we are what we eat. I, I did a quick survey. Um, somebody said yesterday we have 226 species of, uh, sorry, varieties of tree in the garden. That's true, but some of them are for sale and, not, and, and they're there for sign wood because uh, we do grafting, uh, but we, we don't really need any more apples than we grow for ourselves. So these are things we harvested last year, uh, roughly speaking. Um, and you can see there's a range of food product a wide range of species and, and a wide range of varieties within those species. One of the key ones I'd point out to you is we have over 60 species of plant that you could pick a salad from about May through to November. Um, if, you're th if you think a salad is lettuce, tomato and cucumber, you might think it's a little odd. But what you get in this is an immense mix of minerals. We're not using any chemicals at all in the garden. Everything is totally natural. And I don't like to call it organic, first of all, because legally in the UK you're not allowed to unless it's registered as such, but also because we're somewhere streets beyond organic because this is an immense polyculture. You can be organic and just be uh, a rotational monoculture, and that's not the same thing at all. So here we are, this is um, yield by month, and um, what you notice is there's a huge peak between June and November. So storing food becomes very important. This is a breakdown of the 
metric ton of food uh, two years ago. It was down a bit last year because um, top fruit suffers from biennialism, which if you get a very heavy yield one year, it's down the next year. At the moment, it's about 400 kilos for this year, but we're only just starting to pick apples, and we've got potatoes and parsnips and carrots and so on to dig, so there's lots more weight to come. Um, <clears throat> how do we do it? No bare soil. Anybody who's read Ruth Stout's books... Uh, I, I love the fact she, she does it with hay and says, um, why would you need horse manure? Because horse manure is just um, hay with a horse taken out. If you use hay, you get all of it. Uh, we use straw. Um, lots of ground cover plants, leaf mould, anything that's biodegradable that's organic. These guys, everybody knows that uh, legumes fix nitrogen, don't they? Yeah, you old fell for it. There's no leguminous plant on the planet that fixes nitrogen. It's bacteria that do it. And they make little houses on their roots. Yeah? So you've got to understand about the living processes in the soil if you really want to husband it well. The other marvellous thing about these guys is they have higher protein in their pollen than anything else. So if you think you've got bee problems, get these guys in and the bees will have a wild time. People ask us if we keep bees. We don't. We've got 20 species of bee to keep themselves. Um, anybody ever feel like this? Well, um, I was disappointed in a couple of things yesterday. Jonathan Porritt doesn't understand that algae are people too. And secondly... Um, we were talking yesterday about that lovely garden in Colorado and how you can kill all the insects with foliar sprays. We try not to kill anything. If you don't have aphids, you won't get blue tits. The point is to have everything alive but in balance. So, I love this quote. Bugs are not going to inherit the earth, they own it. <laughs> so we might as well make peace with the landlord and that's what we do all the time. And we employ willing workers on organic farms. We have a great deal. Um, these guys, um, as the figure was quoted this morning, uh, read Charles Darwin, you'll work out that in our garden we have about two tons of these. You know those dumpy bags that they deliver aggregate in off the back of a truck? They're about so big. Those, those contain a ton. So imagine two bags like that. These guys don't stop for lunch. They don't stop at the weekend. Uh, they don't take holidays, they slow down a bit in the winter, uh, you don't have to pay them, and they feed themselves. <laughs> I have got an intern coming in a couple of weeks' time, but we should use them rarely. These guys are splendid, and all the other people in the soil who work with them. Mycelium. Fungi are the most fantastic life system on the planet. Largest yet measured in Oregon, 950 hectares. Do you know how many blue whales you can fit in 950 hectares? These guys rule the world. They really do. Um, Paul Stamets, whom I'll quote at the end, um, talks about them as the next uh, information revolution because if we could just work out how to use hi-fi and mycelium, we could probably all communicate with each other and throw away everything electric because they really do talk to each other right across the planet and they are so important to life in the soil. Okay. These are shiitake, by the way. My son and my wife with 15 minutes harvest from the garden. This is same latitude as Alaska, folks. References. Useful books. And open day at Garden Cottage. Ten minutes work. How to, how to get a, a little bit more of my lunch rather than somebody else eating it. Oh, well, eat them um, is the short route. Um, uh, trophic levels mean that at each stage of digestion, uh, food gets concentrated tenfold. So, you know, if you're a vegetarian and you eat lettuce, you get, you know, a factor of one food. Um, if you eat the caterpillars that eat the lettuce, you get a factor of ten food. So that's the shortcut. 
Um, just keep things in balance. Um, there are 35 species of songbird in this garden that nest. There are 20 that come for their lunch and another 20 that come on their holidays. There are ducks which go around eating slugs. Um, there are just so many things. There are hundreds and thousands of invertebrates, literally. It's probably about 500 species of moth. And what these things are all doing is all eating each other. The thing, the, the, the thing that I would say to you is there is no such thing as a good plant or a bad plant, a good insect or a bad insect, because these are all part of God's creation, whichever God you believe in, but they are all part of the creation. And as Ogden Nash said, uh, the good Lord in his wisdom created the fly and then forgot to tell us why. But, you know... Everything has a place in nature, so if you invite all of nature into your garden, they'll all look after each other. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, may I ask a follow-on? Uh, no. No, it would be better if somebody else asked a question. Um, <laughs> you can talk to me afterwards. Thank you. How do you grow um, carrots and parsnips in your polyculture system? Do they have a separate lovely seed bed? Well, this is a forest garden. So um, forest is, comes from the old Norman. It doesn't mean trees at all. It means the king's hunting ground. So essentially what we're doing is we're building a hunter-gatherer system. And within the forest, you have clearings. So in the clearings, we grow vegetables such as those that need the sunlight. And, and um, we've been playing around with sowing carrots inside the middle of toilet rolls and planting those out so we can bring them on under glass and get them started earlier. And parsnips? Yeah, same. Thank you. Can I ask you to get the mic to uh, the gentleman? I can speak loudly. You speak loudly. <laughs> I speak loudly. Um, what about digging? Do you do any digging? Or now it's more fashionable, perhaps, not to dig? We practice minimum tillage, not no dig. Um, and it's difficult to lift potatoes if you don't dig them out of the ground, for example, uh, or carrots or parsnips. Um, uh, but we try to minimise the amount of tillage we do because tillage actually destroys soil structure. If the ground's very compacted, we dig it, uh, and, and that's happened sometimes after very heavy rain, for example, but we minimise it. Mostly we feed the ground from the top down, so we just keep putting mulch on top. Hi. We've, we've inherited a, a field which is just absolutely chock-a-block with nettles uh -huh. and people keep telling us that we should be spraying them and doing all sorts of ghastly things. Um, we, we cut regularly... Change your friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so. <laughs> um, we, we cut regularly and the sheep will eat it, the sheep will eat the nettles once yes. they've been laid, etc. But I mean, were we to actually start planting that area, could yes. we just rebalance it by planting lots more of other things? Rewind. Um, what, what's the, the, the best part of the answer is you need to learn about plants as indicators. Uh, and, right. and this is one of the best things you can learn in, in, in permaculture circles. What do nettles tell you about the soil? Well, we were told that it was too good by... <laughs> no, we not too... By you can never have soil was... that's too good. Yeah. It's very rich in nitrogen. So this is telling you it's very good soil. So it's the sign that it was previously inhabited or it had livestock in it or there was some reason why it built up high levels of nitrogen. So um, harvest the nettles, um, put them into water butts and use it as a, a tea to fertilise other things in the garden with and then do whatever else you were going to do with the garden. Um, if you want to grow plants in it, then you know, the easiest way to start is by sheep mulching. Right, which is what I've been doing, actually. I've been doing lasagna, oh. lasagna beds and things. Marvellous. Yeah, OK. All right, thank you very much. How exact are you when it comes to polyculture and companion planting? And also, do you have a ratio of roughly of perennials with annuals, things like that? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is another one, isn't it? Uh, people come in the garden and say, where's the worm farm? You're standing in it, you know? This is, do you do companion planting? Yes, everything in the garden is a companion with everything else. This is what polyculture is. And you'll find out things like, you know, if you plant tagetes with potatoes, it tends to deter nematodes so your potatoes don't get damaged by the wee worms. Um, there's a truth to this, you know, because they have root exudations that do that. But the reality is that all the plants in our garden are feeding off each other. Uh, do we measure what we plant where? No, it's, it's much more instinctive than that. We measure everything we harvest, 
and we notice when we have an opportunity to try new things uh, and we try to learn from the experience. Not everything works, you know, but I hope that answers your question, does it? Yeah. Good. I've got a couple of questions here. One of them you can answer really quickly, which is um, you talked about Syria and Libya being, uh, you know, moving to desert. Is that because of climate change or is it because of war? No, it's because of what we did to the land. Uh, you mean dropping... Uh, we've exhausted the soils. Okay, okay. We've cut the trees down. Okay, so that's repairable. Goats, goats, one of the biggest things that extends to the Sahara is goats. Yeah, so that's repairable. So my personal question is, um, and it might not be two, some... That's cheeky. Sorry. <laughs> He's just two. She, she, did warn, she did warn you. <laughs> yes. Um, is, um, I, I, I'm from the east of England, or we have a... a rain level of probably Spain and I'm working on very sandy soil. I'm a good permaculturist and I do all the right things. But I find that the soil is so sandy that there aren't any, you know, like um, the crevices in it. You know, it's really hard to actually... Yeah. Where exactly you've had are you? In what? Cambridge. In Cambridge itself? Uh, on the outside of Cambridge. In yeah, you have the same rainfall as us, which is 600 millimetres. Okay. Uh, although we're in Scotland, it doesn't necessarily mean it's terribly wet because we're on the east coast. The difference is you'll have more evaporation in summer than we do because it'll be a bit warmer, but not a lot warmer. Yeah. Um, so you just have to keep building the soil is the answer. You just have to keep adding humus. If you can get any clay to put on it as well, that's fine, but as much organic matter as you can put on as possible. You're trying to build soil crumbs, soil structure, and just keep building the soil. You heard what Jeff said this morning, year on year. Okay. It'll get better. Great. That's Talk to I'm it doing. nicely.